Hello, welcome to The Viewpoint. I am Mumudumbuj. Engulfed in economic crisis and there is no end in sight. That's really the state of the world right now, really. No idea when the Russia-Ukraine war would end. And we are still amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Many low and middle income countries are really suffering. They are in debt crisis grappling with the situation. Um, to some, this makes um, the need for a global lender of last resort ever more important. And perhaps the only institution with the resources, mandate, and global reach to help almost any country facing severe economic distress is the IMF. Indeed, recently, apparently, the value of its emergency loans reached record levels as a growing number of states turn to it for help. But is the IMF fit for purpose, as one commenter to ask recently? And how is the institution assisting our country right now in this crisis? I have here the resident representative of the IMF, Mr. Mamadou Barry. Welcome to the viewpoint. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Boj, for having me. You're welcome. Of course, when one hears the name Mamadou Barry, we have so many Mamadou Barrys around, we might assume that you are, you are Gambian. But, but, but you are not. Give us a bit about your background. Well, I'm Mamadou Barry. It's true that I meet a lot of Barrys around when I walk around Gambia mm -hmm. on the street or when I go to the market and even in the administration. But uh, I'm from Guinea, uh, which is a country that uh, not far from here. So we share the same culture, um, the same type of population that we have. We have Mandinkas, they have Mandinkas here, Fulazar in Guinea. And it's the same Fula that we have that Barry's name here. So, uh, you know, being here, I feel like being at home. Absolutely. The whole re region, really, we are interrelated in one form or another. Yeah. That's it. So, so now we, we get into our subject, um, the IMF. By way of framing our discussion, d tell us a bit more about the IMF. For some of us, we just have broad ideas, broad concepts. We know that sort of they give loans, then which prompts one to think, are they banks? Do they charge interest? <laughs> you know, in a frivolous way. So tell us a bit more about the IMF before. It's a background. Mm -hmm. So the IMF is an international organization that was created with the World Bank in 1944, just after the aftermath of the World War II, in order to bring all countries together to see how they can cooperate uh, in monetary terms to promote our uh, financial stability around the world, but also promote uh, prosperity, so growth that is inclusive, which means a growth that is widely shared uh, among the populations of the member countries. Uh, right now we have 190 uh, countries that are members of the uh, International Monetary Fund, and actually we work on three main areas. Uh, the first one is on policy analysis and uh, policy advice, uh, what we call um, surveillance. And every time to time, we come to different countries, all member countries, to do a diagnostic of their economic situation and see what are the risks they are facing and evaluate the policies that they are conducting to see how that fit with a global environment and then provide uh, policy advice. In that same policy advice, we also um, produce sometime twice a year some document, uh, some report, like the World Economic Outlook that is produced twice a year, which give an overall view, a global view of how the world economy is going and what are the challenges that the world economy is facing. We have the Global Stability Report that focus on the financial sector, so central bankers, what they are uh, you know, facing in the financial sector. We have the Fiscal Monitor also, that the flagship uh, our publication that we do every uh, twice a year that also focus on fiscal policy. We have other regional report that also we, we do. That is mainly the, the surveillance part. The second one is the lending part. Um, IMF was created to support countries that f are facing a uh, balance of payment, which mean countries that have difficulties in meeting their external payment obligations, let's say paying the debt or paying the import that they are facing. So that we have f f type of lending that is appropriate given the level of development of the country. So we have 
the lending that goes to advanced and emerging market economies that be an interest rate uh, at the market rate, but lower than what is the market on the market rate ap that apply on the special drawing right. I think you are familiar with this. Is the currency mm -hmm. that the uh, the IMF has. We have for the low income countries loans that are zero interest rate. For now, it's reviewed every once a while, given the condition and the financing that we receive from partners to support low income countries, the interest rate on those loans are uh, revised. For, for now, for, for many years now, the interest rate on that is zero. Now the third leg is what they call uh, capacity development. We do knowledge sharing, we provide training and technical assistance to government officials to help them build their institutions but also um, help them make effective uh, policy. So those are the three main objective of the IMF. As I will summarize it, I have a table uh, of, of, uh, pending in my office mm. by a Gambian that represents the IMF as three things. Mm -hmm. The first is an architect, an architect yes. which is we shape the global economy. We are a doctor, which is linked to our surveillance we are a firefighter lending countries in need and then we are a coach giving uh, capacity development to, uh, to to member countries absolutely surveillance lending and capacity um, development i wonder was that the original vision in 1944 in 1944 the original vision was to help regulate the exchange rate between countries it was the war, most of the war was due to unfair competition that was happening between uh, countries. You know, when um, trade is not working, trade is a factor that bring peace. So when there is a disruption on the trade trading system, it create conflict. So to regulate that facilitated payment between the member countries, uh, the IMF was designed to be able to fix rules that will govern how currencies around the world will exchange um, between each other. And at that time, the gold was the, 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 the reference that we were using until I think on during the 70s, when the gold loan was uh, removed and then it was changed to, to, to order. But the idea was to how to see, how to cooperate to ensure that we have a, a stable world economy. But you would say that um, it had evolved to incorporate all the rules as well, or the functions. In, in. What, what would you attribute that to? It's sort of widening, as it were, purview. It's widening um, circle, as, as it were, of concerns and interventions. You know, the IMF is an institution as anyone else. We looked at what the world is facing. So based on the challenges that the world is facing, we also adjust our tools and the way we operate. We have throughout the years integrated a lot of issues on what we do, like the poverty reduction that was introduced. That was, it was there, but an emphasis was put into it around the 90s, where we created uh, the PRG uh, TF, where all program was supposed to be more focused on poverty reduction, not only to come and uh, ensure that the macroeconomic is balanced, but we were trying to to ensure that the reform that are conducted are conducive to poverty reduction. So the growth that is generated is more is more balanced. We also have included issues related to gender, recognizing the role that women plays in the economy and their contribution into um, making effective policies and the fact that many women that have the potential to work are underutilized. So their role to the economy recognizing that we have a strategy on gender. Uh, the climate is an issue that uh, we are confronted with. Gambia is one, we, the flooding that happened recently uh, is a good example of how uh, climate is affecting our economy, so that also have been brought as a key uh, element to, to, to our core mandate. So as things evolve, the pandemic during COVID, we, we did a lot of thinking, financing, support, dialogue, you know, 
calling for support to member countries during that time. So we are a constant evolution and we are trying to make sure that we respond to the need of our member countries. That's it. Well, well, here I'm inclined to ask, how, how does the IMF work? Um, the funding staff, I mean, it's a, it comprises, what, 190 countries? Do you have political appointments in it? How, how does it work? How are decisions reached, for instance? It will be interesting. So the IMF, the ultimate governing body of the IMF is the Board of Governors. So that represents, for the case in the, of the Gambia, the Minister of Finance, who is the governor of the, the IMF in the Gambia. We have an alternate governor, which is uh, the governor uh, of, the, of the central bank. So that governing body um, meet every year during the annual meeting to give a global orientation of where the institutions will be heading in the next 12 years. And then you have the executive board in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the IMF. Those are appointed by the member countries based on their mm -hmm. preference and you know the way um, how they decide to distribute the forces among the group that uh, uh, it's represented on that chair. So we have 24 of them. Um, and then between those two, you have what they call the International Monetary and Financial Committee that actually help is a, a link between the governor, uh, the board of governors and the, um, the board of directors. So to help uh, think through what needs to be done and make sure that the ideas given by the board of governors is translated into policy that can be effectively implemented by the board of uh, directors. And then the staff is recruited based on the competitive, um, competitive basis. So, and uh, most we, we try to, to make sure that almost all member countries are represented in the, the, the staff. We have more than 150, I'm not sure about mm. it, but we have mm. more than 150 countries that are represented among the staff. So that is really uh, huge. It's a it's very inclusive ent institution. And, and, and no, no, no doubt decisions by taken by voting. At what level is there? Uh, On the voting right, uh, mm. you know, the, the, the quota of countries determine the right of vote. And that quota is determined based on the size of the country on the global economy. Um, so, so you have the advanced economies that have more voting rights, so have higher quotas because of the share that they have on the, the world economy. And we have constant review of those quotas. We are now, I think we completed the 15 one in, in 2020. And there is one ongoing, the 16th review of quotas uh, that is expected to complete next year. So as the world evolves, those quotas also are recalculated. And, uh, and if there is a shift on the relative share of one country is then that will be reflected into the next review that uh, will be conducted. So there is constant review of those uh, those quotas. That's it, but isn't that really one of the criticisms they, they make against <laughs> the, the IMF, the, the fact of this weighted um, um, voting? So you, so possibly you 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 become um, become under the influence of this bigger countries, smaller countries like ours, of course, who <laughs> worry, sh should worry ab ab about this. I isn't that the case for, for a very long time? You, you were seen as pushing the Washington agenda, isn't it? No, you, I will put it this way. I think sometimes is a, a lack of understanding of how the IMF work. Uh, the surveillance, we do it to all member countries, regardless whether you are a, advanced economy or a small economy, they, uh, they, what they call Article 4. is the uh, annual checkup we do every year for country without program, or countries that has a program. Since the program is a way to evaluate the economy, more often you can go to uh, two years, up to two years to do the Article 4. So that is done regardless of whether you are advanced economy or low income economy, where we evaluate 
we see the risk and we give you an independent view of how you see your policies. The second is the capacity development. Capacity development or is on a need basis and we provide it to all countries that require some uh, support on, uh, on capacity development. And that is funded actually by advanced economies sometimes uh, uh, heavily uh, to help build capacity in, in low income country. The third one, which is the most controversial, is about the lending. That lending uh, is based on requests. So countries has to request the need to be supported on the IMF program before the IMF come. And it's the staff that come and discuss and agree on the term of the program. And that is what is proposed to the board. So until the document go to the board, is the governing rule that apply to everybody that are apply onto the country based on the request and the, the conditions of the country. And when a document go to the board, usually is often agreed on based on consensus. You rarely see a program document brought to the, to the board and then uh, that being rejected. When it's get there, that means there is a global consensus on the need to support the country. But the requests, again, come from the country. The reform that are there are the country's reform that are validated or agreed with the staff of the International Monetary Fund. So uh, often it's just a matter of not understanding how it works that we receive those kind of criticism. That's it. I mean, you, you find that when, when countries are in economic distress or, or, or crisis, they, they have to run back to you. As I said earlier, you're the one with the power, with the reach to, to do <laughs> a lot. But, but I suppose maybe the criticism is more often made in terms of your economic model, as it were, this economic ideology of the neoliberal, as, as it were, um, um, economics, that is really your model. You are not very um, um, willing to acknowledge other models, which affects your lending. When you lend, you lay certain conditions along those lines. How would you respond to that? I think the economy is universal. The theory, economic theory is something that is taught to all of us. But there are many schools of thought, yeah, surely. Yeah, there are many schools of thought, mm. and we have all those thoughts uh, embedded into the IMF. And mm. when we come with our model, we present it to the authorities, we get feedback. When we are on mission, I think uh, uh, it's even a need to take this opportunity to thank UTV for attending all our debriefing mi meeting at the end of the mission, where we inform them about the policies and the agreement that we have with the authorities. So when we assess the economic conditions of a country, we check it against what we hear from the private sector. So we consult the private sector of the country to hear them how they feel, what are the solutions, what are the problems they have. We meet with the civil society that explain to us what are the problems and what are the solutions they foresee for the country to get out of the crisis. We talk with different experts on the government side at all levels. And it's based on that, that constitutes the input that we put on our framework, which is an agreed framework that uh, the authorities are aware of, that we are aware of, and we discuss whether what we propose is actually fit to the con situation of the, of the country. And then uh, those solutions are, are, are provided. Actually, the funding that we pro provide to countries is to give them a breathing space. Let's say you are in a crisis. You, if you have to adjust to bring yourself into a sustainable level, what will happen? You have either to raise taxes extremely high or cut spending drastically. So, and uh, that is very painful on the population. So what the IMF does is to help put in place policies that will get result, not today, but in medium term, like uh, next year, one year or two, so that revenue can be raised gradually. 
the spending can be made more efficient, more um, prioritization, and then give you the possibility of funding your core uh, spending uh, during the time that we are observing your situation to get the result that we envision in the program. So that's the way it, it works. So IMF coming in, give more space for the authorities to get to the result that they agree in achieving uh, during the program. Okay, this is what people say, that cutting the spending, the effect it, it, it really has on, on, on people may be, could be economically sound, but some people say that it seems politically inept because the voters appear to be um, um, worse off and then the, the politicians, they'll be less popular it might even some people have said that the IMF sort of imposed ERM, our economic recovery program of the 1980s, in many ways caused the coup. People were suffering. Wh how would you respond to this? I, I will say this. This is just a, an example I, I, mm. gi I gave. Mm. I gave you the Gambian budget. 2018, no program. The budget was around execution level, I think it was around 17 to 20 billion. This year budget. You have watched it at the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. It's about 35 yeah. billion. So we went from 18 billion in 2018, now 35. So to give you a perspective. So the program is not only about cutting. The program is a package that helped bring the financing. One important aspect of IMF program is uh, we, we give a, a signaling effect. So when we come, all the partners, private sector, development partners, come to accompany the reform that the government is doing. So it brings more resources to the country. So actually, in the case of the Gambia, the program is not a program that is cut in spending, but it's a program that is helping um, increase spending in areas where it's well needed and social spending have increased significantly. Capital spending on GLF that was around 800, about 600 billion in 2019, was 3.2 billion in 2021, 20, uh, and this year it will go around 3 billion again. So you see the amount of capital spending the government w was able to do because of the the funds that the program was able to leverage for the country. So it's not only a matter of cutting spending, it's a matter of spending right and helping them improve revenue collection and that being done in a way that it's conducive to good business environment. That, that's it, but this is the point. But, but again, the, the help here um, would have the condition that they are um, um, doing reforms. There are reforms being carried on. What, what sort of reforms would, would you expect our country to, to, to be making, really? Yeah, we are doing various reforms, and um, our document, uh, we publish our document, so every time we finish a review, uh, the review document entirely is published, so I uh, encourage uh, the Gambian to go and read it. So we have various reforms that um, go from PFM reform, uh, we had put in place this medium-term economic fiscal framework that ensure you have alignment between the, the National Development Plan and the budget, which is a bridge, bridge document that help ensure that what the budget is doing is aligned with the, the, um, the National Development Plan. We help on procurement to improve the procurement process. Uh, with the GPP Act uh, being uh, approved recently to improve efficiency on the spending. On GRA, we have an expert working with them. Uh, we had reform regarding the improvement of the quality of the registry of uh, taxpayers, which is now uh, completed. We helped them build a ledger. The ledger is, the, is a way to, to help GRA make sure that they know each taxpayer what he owe. So when they send you a, a request to pay the tax, uh, they keep record on the taxes that you did not pay, what you have paid, so they know the balance that you, you owe. So that's what they call the ledger, and we have helped them build that. On SOEs, we are been working with them 
in terms of uh, putting in place uh, performance contracts. Uh, there is already one with uh, NAWIC and we're working with uh, GNPC, uh, um, the Port of the Gambia and the Social Security to, to, to have a, a performance contract to make sure that uh, um, they, they, they follow certain rule of governance and the quality of accounting and, uh, and operations. We at the central bank for the first time, the central bank was able to do a stress test of the entire banking system and now they will be doing that every quarter to be part of the, the work that they are doing at, uh, at the MPCs. So we have various reforms that cover all sectors to make sure that there is a coherent uh, policies that the government is conducting uh, to, to, to get out of the fragility in which they are. That's it. But you see, Mr. Barry, as I listened to your sort of rosy <laughs> portrayal of what was going on in the improvements all over, um, I, I just can't help thinking, oh, poverty has gone up from 53 percent. The procurement you're talking about, well, at least in the papers, in the media, there's so much talk of um, corruption. The procurement is, is not going on well in SOEs. Apparently, there was a report I read, I think 0.6 percent, 0.4 percent of GDP is going into them. It's not working. So it's almost like when we look on the ground, how we see things, somehow whatever is going on at that level appears not to be translating into change the reality mm -hmm. here, a change of reality. How, how do you respond to that? I would say it's a gradual thing. So we, I know there is a lot of expectation coming from 22 years of dictatorship. Uh, the Gambian came after 2017 with a lot of hope. Um, they, they are w expecting a lot from government and the international community have been here since then to help them improve onto those areas where they were not pro do, do doing well. The SOEs, um, there is an SOE bill uh, under consideration, so that will help improve the governance and the, um, the accounting framework. We are actually giving some training on IFRS to make sure that the, the Accounting standard is um, um, is uh, you know meet the international standard in accounting. So we gave in the training, and the new law will oblige all the the SOEs to to follow to follow that. So when that is in place, it, that may improve the situation. We on this uh, procurement is 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 the, as the result of an assessment that we did in two thousand. I think 18 or 19 on what they call PIMA, Public Investment and uh, Management Assessment, that we saw gaps on the procurement and uh, the bill aim at addressing those gaps. So the bill just passed. I think the government is working on the regulations that are also at a very advanced stage. So we hope with that bill coming in, there will be an improvement on the procurement system. On poverty, uh, COVID affected a lot of people, especially those Gambian economy is dominated by the informal sector where youth and women are employed. So you have COVID that affected many parts of the population and you have climate change that is also affecting agriculture with a large share of the population working on agriculture and that this repetitive shock on the climate front is affecting the, the people. So that is the reason why we show the trend, the declining trend of poverty we had up to 2019 was reverted as shown by the recent um, uh, published data uh, by, by GBOS. But, you know, uh, government is working uh, with uh, other development partners to bring more resources into the agricultural sector to build a more resilient agricultural sector, but that will take time since the projects are just approved, will take time to, to, uh, to provide results. So, you know, that's, that, that, that's the direction, but it will take some time to, to be to that for the population on the ground to, to feel uh, the result. Yes, so, obviously, the COVID is a common crisis, but we've seen different responses depending on the government. How 
have been our response in this country? So um, the, the, the response, the COVID response in the Gambia was very coordinated uh, with development partners and the private sector, which I think was a very, very positive thing to, to, to note. We saw when COVID came, an increased solidarity between Gambians, let's say from the diaspora, the private sector, contributing to support families that were under lockdown or those that were affected by the isolation so due to the fact that they are exposed to the virus. Uh, we as the IMF, when COVID-19 happened, um, it was at the time where we approved this three-year program. We approved our program in, in on the I think the 26th of March 2020. And that was just when the first cases of COVID came. But three weeks after that, we had to come with additional funding to support the country. We provided 21.3 million US dollars to help the country. It's come timely, but uh, just before the food distribution program in May wa was provided. So it was fast and timely uh, to help the government face the unprecedented crisis that they were facing. And then in, uh, we the expectation was that COVID will end in the next six months. That's why we gave that level of support. But when we saw what happened in August 2021, uh, with all the cases and the death that we were seeing, we had to come with additional uh, funding uh, for the government. So we were able to increase the level of access at that time by, let's say it was 20 million SDR, which is about 30 million US dollars uh, to help the, the, the country restart the economy in 2021, but also address additional um, shock that the, 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 they were facing, you know, through the repetitive uh, uh, wave that we were ha having. So we came strongly to, to, to support the country mm -hmm. and other partners are also, we're also doing uh, similar support to, to the Gambia. Yes, it, you, you've said that our COVID response was well coordinated, but I think it was the, the World Bank, wasn't it? They said that the food distribution was quite inefficient, lack of data. There were all sorts of reasons. So I'm not sure whether it was as coordinated as you would like to. Talking about coordination at the yeah. partner level, uh, you mm. know, um, interventions mm -hmm. that are generalized is hard to be efficient. But many countries, not only Gambia, were in a situation where the administrative capacity and this, the targeting instrument were not there. So we either had to stop everything and wait until we are able to target and give the food to the, those that are the most un, uh, vulnerable or give it to everyone because everyone was um, affected to some, so some degree. And many countries unfortunately uh, opted for that option and which was most costly and um, more inefficient than giving it to uh, with a more targeted, uh, in a more targeted way. But those instrument we're not there. All right. Okay. I think that's the right place for us to um, take a break. Um, we'll be right back. Q Money, the biggest mobile money service in the Gambia, has taken mobile banking to the next level. Now you can link your Q Money wallet with your bank account. Yes, link your Ajib or Echo Bank accounts with your Q Money wallet and get instant access to your cash anytime. No need to queue at the bank anymore. Transfer funds from your bank account to your wallet or your wallet to your bank account using Q Money Bank Link. is the fastest, most secure, and convenient way to transfer funds between your wallet and bank account. For more information, call our customer care on 133. Q Money, Sunyu Kalpe. Terms and conditions apply. Hello, welcome back to The Viewpoint. Today, my guest is Mr. Mamadi Bari, the res resident representative of the um, IMF in this country. Here, we're going to talk about, we've been talking about the IMF and the programs here, and what is it all about? Um, um, thank you there, Mr. Barry. We are back. Um, 
So we'll talk about the, the programs, what I, that this hap, um, I'm having here, how it is helping us. The other day I read about um, what is called extended credit facility. We've had a few <laughs> reviews, isn't it? We're in our fourth or fifth, something like that. Tell us a bit about that. How does it help? So the extended credit facility is um, a medium term uh, support facility to countries that are low income countries uh, to help them improve on their balance of payments. As you know, when um, Gambia in 2017 came to a new dispensation, uh, the level of reserve was almost uh, less than a month uh, of import. They have a debt that was unsustainable. Uh, so to help address those um, critical element uh, in for the Gambian economy, uh, a program was needed. So first what we did was to help Gambia bring that debt to a sustainable level. So we, we help uh, frame a dialogue with uh, key development partners that are lenders to the Gambia to defer some of the, um, the debt that was due in the next five years. So we wanted to give Gambia a five year breeding period where uh, the resources could be allocated to social spending rather than paying the debt. So they were able to save around 158 million for the next five to seven years on debt service payment. So that helped the Gambian debt to be uh, sustainable and then and provide us the possibility of coming in with what they call the extended credit facility. So that facility is a three-year facility that have every six months a review. So we have conducted so far four reviews that are uh, successful. Um, now we are in the process of finalizing uh, the fifth review of the program. We have a board meeting that is uh, expected to happen on the 14th of December. And uh, if that review is um, conclusive, uh, there will be additional um, um, fund uh, for the Gambia. That's it. But of course, about about um, debt it generates so much heat, so so much discussion. Um, 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 really, we, we keep saying that we are um, um, taking on so much debt, then we end up paying for it and the interest on it, which is taking away, as it were, from social spending. This is generally our perception of, of, of these things. What, what do you make of it, for instance, here? Um, sort of we are spending much more than we are earning. Then that means <laughs> we, we are in debt. How, how, how do you see that? We are taking so much debt, we cannot spend on social services. We are having to service these debts. Yeah, debt is um, isn't necessary in the course of a country development process. What is important is what you are using the debt for. If you are in downturn, taking debt to build on productive capacities that can generate later more taxes, more activity in the economy, more development to help repay the debt, then it's good to take the debt. It's taking the debt and misusing the resources that is problematic. But the debt per se is not a problem um, for a country to have because it's help provide you additional resources and invest in productive capacity that you would not be able to do without that additional funding that you receive from a partner that is lending that to you. A and one important also element you to, to emphasize is given the level of development of the Gambia, most partners are providing grant to the Gambia. So our advice is to maximize the use of those um, grants and uh, seek on the loan side, rather than taking commercial loan, you know, focusing on more concessional loan that are provided by those multilateral um, development that provide loan that have a grant component that is higher than 35%. So the Gambia is, um, the our recommendation is to focus more on grant and non-concessional loan to help assure that the pace of repayment 
is spread enough for the country to generate enough wealth to be able to repay it in a sustainable way. Yes, that's your recommendation, like that's your advice. Is that actually what we are doing? Yeah. We have a bro borrowing target, we have a borrowing plan in the program that we have. Uh, last year, the government had 100 million possibility of borrowing externally. They did zero borrowing. Uh, this year, they have almost the same amount. I think so far, they borrowed only around 60. So they are well below that the level of borrowing that uh, they are giving as a space in the program. It's on the domestic debt that is uh, um, going faster than than expected, but uh, they, they are working in ensuring that uh, the, the borrowing and the, uh, the maturity of domestic debt also are, are extended so that the risk of rollover and things like that are also uh, well, well managed. Uh, yes, so I wonder, how would you, of course, we know that we are living in uncertainty, really. Nobody knows, as I said, when the war would end and the pandemic and, and all the rest of it. But how would you characterize, how would you describe our economic outlook, as it were? Uh, the Gambia is recovering. Uh, we have, um, during COVID, the growth rate of in 2020 was around 0.6%, so less, less than 1%. It's low but was better than countries that are similar uh, to, to the Gambia. And in 2021, the growth rate was around 4.3%. And we expect this year uh, growth to be 45 and then go to 6% in 2023. It's gradually recovering, but that recovery was lower than what we expected before. Our expectation, particularly for 2022, was to have a growth close to 6%, was 5.7%. That was our initial um, projection coming to the year. But given the Ukraine war with the impact that it has on the cost of living and the, uh, the import costs that have created a lot of strain on the FX market and uh, the remittances slightly declining, coming steadily well, still well above what we had in 2020, but slightly lower than what we have in, 20, uh, in 2021. So that is contributed to lowering uh, the prospect for growth for 2022 and uh, 2023. So the growth, we are gradually recovering, but at a lower pace than expected. The tourist sector is surprising us positively compared to what we initially envisaged. Um, we have now, at end October, a, a level of tourist arrival that is more than the entire year of 2021 and almost doubling the same level that we have last year. So we, if that continues, that will give more momentum uh, to give more economic activity to the country, but also provide more effects uh, to, 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 to support um, the country in terms of uh, FX availability. That's it. But I wonder though, in what areas do you think, do you reckon that we are not doing so well? Areas that need improvement? Um, you, you know, it's, it's, this is a developing country. Mm. So it's a country that needs a constant improvement. Uh, there are some frameworks that are put in place. Uh, there are some improvement that are happening, but those improvement need to be strengthened and sustained. So in PFM, I talked about a lot of improvement that are happening, but we need still to continue to, to strengthen the processes, make sure that um, the IFME system that is now used at the central level continue to be decentralized. They are already doing it, but uh, that effort need to continue. Uh, on GRA, they need to improve the, the IT system. They have already a new system for the custom administration. 
and they are working with development partners to have another system that will improve at the domestic revenue collection uh, um, uh, office um, to improve the, the IT system there. The procurement need to be strengthened. Uh, now that we have the new GPPA Act, we need to ensure that Act is put into implementation as quickly uh, as possible. And then the global, you know, economic environment. I think everything that can be done to improve access to finance, um, the fintech is evolving, but there's still a lot of room uh, to, to grow. Uh, access banks, um, accessing to the informal sector and the population in remote area, there's a lot that can be done there. So improving the business environment, connectivity, internet, and all that need to be strengthened uh, so that the country become more efficient, attract more foreign investors for the country to grow even more uh, given the, compared to what, uh, what we have now. So the country, there is everywhere areas to be improved, uh, although we have positive sign also that we are seeing here and there. So that effort need to be uh, continued. That's it. Um, um, my next area of, of questioning, we, we didn't spend much time here because we touched on it um, earlier on, is sort of what I might call the political sort of aspects, how people view the, the IMF, the overbearing nature that they call it, or, you know, advancing the, the, the Washington agenda and, and, and that sort of thing. W one wonders, I think we've been with the IMF since 1967. And when you look at it, in many ways, there have been improvements here and there, but it appears we are just going around in, 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 in circles. Perhaps the institution that we need, the sort of developmental leaps that we need, it's really not the, the IMF. <laughs> what, what, what do you think? Well, you know, the issue here is um, it's not IMF or other. Mm. We have seen um, IMF worked in many emerging market economies before, and we are seeing where they are now. Uh, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are countries working with the IMF. We see how they are progressing. The problem we have in many countries we stop is the stop and go of the reform. So we have reform momentum that start to be a result, and then we stop. And then when we come back again, it's the same issues that we have. So uh, what needs to be done is to ensure that we have sustainability on the reform with or without IMF at the country level that that effort is sustained. And the IMF will always be there to provide the usual support that we can in terms of providing candid and independent opinion and advice on the policies that are conducted, providing resources when it's needed, and building capacity where those capacity gaps exist. So uh, we need sustainability, and uh, with the IMF, uh, we are stand ready to support our member countries uh, based on the needs that they are. So the development, I think, uh, is something that need to be uh, viewed internally and countries have to drive their own development agenda by having a sustainable uh, uh, sustainable path of reform that are sustained and then we build on the gain that we are progressively getting and then we will see we see a uh, development yes yeah, so but some people do, do accuse the, the IMF of sort of applying a kind of one size fits all. I mean, we'll bring sort of examples like state-led development that we've seen in the East, in, in, in Asia, was it in Indonesia, Thailand, Japan, perhaps China, we, we're seeing it there. there. But the IMS bias is, is sort of towards deregulation and all the sort of stuff that we've been trying over the years, and it, n nothing is going on. How, how would you see that chart? No, again, I think it's a, a misinterpretation. All right. If you have efficient 
public enterprises that are efficient, contributing to your budget, to leveraging on the resources, and providing you the resources needed, rendering the service that is effective, efficient, at the satisfaction of the population. The IMF will not come and say, for the sake of just closing it, close it. But if you have So there will SOEs, be no condition that things must be de deregulated. We no, do this. you can read our program. We are calling strengthening of the governance and the financial condition of the SOEs so that they don't constitute a drag to the budget. So the idea is, is to have sustainability. So the resources, sustainable resources that can be dedicated for development. You don't want the resource, the taxpayers, to be used to bailing out an SOE that is not performing. And you have similar SOEs in the private sector that is the main contributor to the tax system. Why you have an SOE in one sector and the private sector in the same sector, having the private sector contributing, being the among the best contributor to the budget, and have the same SOEs in the same sector being a drag to the budget. So that's, th th that's the difficult uh, trade-off that needs to be, to be done. So a performing SOEs, efficient, that deliver good service, is always welcome, but uh, it's they need to be efficient, well-managed, and uh, render the service for which they, they are created for. So you mean the so-called um, neoliberal bias is a myth? Say it. Huh? <laughs> you say it. <laughs> no, but of course, um, many que people will, will, will question that. Um, um, we, we are coming towards the end here. Um, you see, we are told that history teaches by analogy. In the 80s, we followed the IMF, you know, in all the economic recovery program and, and the like. But afterwards, you know, new scholarly material was emerging, saying that perhaps that was the wrong model. I think that even the IMF, I think, acknowledged th th that, that sort of thing. So one wonders, what have been learned and the prospects of reform to keep pace with evolving realities that people live. W what would you say about that? Yes, again, I, I will say is that stop and go. Start mm -hmm. a reform. Reform is always, always come with difficulties. But if you leave the reform at the middle of the difficulties, you fall into more difficulties. So, um, the, the, the message here is when you start a process, go until you see the result of the process before you back up. So it's important that that sustainability be there. As I said before at the beginning, IMF is in constant transformation to make sure that we adapt our tool and our thinking and our resources to meet the need of our population. To give you an example, with COVID and the climate, IMF added recently a new facility that called the Resilience and Sustainable Tool, which is a long-term financing that did not exist before to help countries finance their climate transition, but also pandemic preparedness. That was not there before, but we have done it to improve the impact of the, the SDR allocations that we did um, in 2021. You, you heard about it. So we are channeling SDR for countries that have good fundamentals toward countries in need to finance climate change, um, investment, and also preparedness uh, on pandemic. Not uh, during the last annual meeting, we had a new fund called, called uh, the food security window, noting the, the, the increase in food insecurity, about 123 million by the end of this year in Sub-Saharan Africa will be confronted with food insecurity. We have seen food insecurity increasing in the Gambia. So countries that don't have a program with the fund can access those resources to help them uh, meet the, um, to fight 
against this food insecurity. So we are evolving constantly to make sure that we meet the need of our membership. Somebody is just talking in my ear. It's time. <laughs> um, thank you very much, there, uh, Mr. Uh, Momodu Bari, for this fantastic um, um, conversation. I think you made a few, you clarified <laughs> uh, a few issues around um, the IFF, uh, the country representative. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Bocha. And thank you very much, um, viewers, for joining us. Until next time, I'm Momodu Goodbye.